before the ECQ. Many others have started using flexible learning before and during the ECQ. And many are shifting to flexible learning uh, in preparation for the opening of classes. The major initiative of the commission to do flexible learning. And this includes number one, uh, capacity building or training of faculty members on how to do flexible learning. Number two, assisting higher educational institutions set up their learning management systems and providing assistance in populating and, gen and uh, putting together the resources that will be available for flexible learning. Next, please. I think the concern on the opening of classes is really because many policymakers and the general public actually think that reinfection is a problem because when HEI is open, they will do the, the usual face-to-face -face or residential learning. The correct term that should be used is not online learning, but flexible. Had the reputation during ECQ. And so the commission uses the word flexible learning. Next, please. What is flexible learning? Online ner learning is a type of learning where you need connectivity, where you, where you, uh, where learning uh, is uh, used uh, or is undertaken uh, not in the traditional uh, classroom setting, but using the full use of technology, particularly internet. Flexible learning is a broader term that includes both. It is the design and delivery of programs, courses, and learning interventions that address the unique needs of students in terms of the pace of learning, the place where they are learning, the process of learning, and the products of and online learning. So the intention is to move higher education to flexible learning. For the universities that can do online learning, that is great. They can, they can do a full, uh, full distance learning or online learning. But for many of the other universities, the more practical solution is to move towards flexible learning. Next, please. And therefore, all the universities are now preparing for the school opening by looking at health protocols, crisis management and communication plans. And because the health situation can change significantly between now and August 20, 2020, as testing expands, as additional laboratories are certified, and as more quarantine centers are established. Next, please. The CHED, therefore, will undertake the following. Issue memorandum to ensure proper implementation, provide technical expertise, give guidelines in the use of quarantine facilities, give technical support in the production distribution of safety kits, disinfectant, train faculty and administrators, and train for business continuity. All these are either being undertaken or will be undertaken by the commission in the following months. We have identified funding sources for this, and we are now talking with providers on how this can be implemented. Next, please. We are, we are forging agreements or have forged agreements with the following government agencies. We are talking with the DICT and the NTC for interconnectivity of and the, and the strength of their internet signals and finding ways on how to improve it. We have agreed with the, with the PRC that all examinations, all licensure exams until June have been canceled. And uh, those that are uh, done only once a year 
will be rescheduled within the year. We are talking with Marina on the welfare of maritime students. We have agreed with DOLE, OWA, and DFA on the repatriation and return of our students. And we are ready to work with the House and Senate Committee whatever laws and policies will be implemented or will be formulated and implemented in the next months. Next, please. The higher education institutions are either undertaking or shall undertake the following. Designing on how to limit physical interaction of, of, of students and faculty in school premises by implementing continuity of inclusive or uh, flexible education approach by the use of, of appropriate modes of delivery making sure that social distancing can be designed, mandatory wearing of masks and provision of alcohol, and other health requirements that the DOH has already formulated, and we will work with the HEIs on how they can best implement this in their respective universities. Next, please. HEI, balik, balik. Balik, HEIs will have to HEIs will have to comply with health, health requirements for disinfection. It's moving back, 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 two bucks there. To make sure that they use a skeletal workforce or work from home arrangements. In the last meeting of the IATF. I was able to uh, I was able to uh, submit a resolution and it was approved that for areas that are no longer under ECQ that HEIs will be allowed to have a skeletal workforce to accept the to compute grades to issue credentials and to prepare for the next school year. This was approved unanimously by the IATF. So we will be issuing an advisory on how this can be implemented. Next, please. So what are the things that will happen in the next two to three months? There are two areas. One is ensuring that there is preparedness for HEIs. And the other one is preparing for the school opening. Next, please. The proposed policy that I discussed with the IATF, and there were no objections to the policy that I proposed, is first, assuming legal issues are resolved. And this is the legal issue with respect to RA 7977, that sets the opening of classes between June and A is uh, quite interesting because it does not make any reference to CHED. And when the RA was approved, CHED had been created, but the IRR has not been approved. It is the position of the commission that CHED is not covered in 1977. And therefore, we have more flexibility on the opening of classes. For example, we have approved the academic calendar for universities that have adopted a trimestral system. There are universities that are not covered by the strict two-semester requirement. But assuming the legal issues are resolved, and we do this in consultation with the leadership of the House and the Senate, and the Department of Justice. We are proposing a rolling opening of classes based on the delivery mode, compliance with health protocols, and situation on the ground. HEIs that are using flexible learning can op open in August 2020. In fact, uh, those that are using completely online learning like Ateneo, De La Salle St. Benilde, 
can actually continue their semesters even if there's an ECQ because it is completely online and therefore there is no problem of social distancing and the others. Other higher education learning and are planning to have significant residential or face-to-face -face learning can open in September or even later in areas that are under modified ECQ. All universities will comply with required protocols. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Next. And I am, uh, I am ready to answer uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Boboy. Uh, at this point, before we continue, I I'd like to introduce uh, two of our uh, uh, fellow congressmen uh, and women. Uh, we have uh, Representative Christine Alexis Tutor of the 3rd District of Bohol. Uh, we have also Representative uh, Divine Grace Yu of the 1st District of Sambuanga del Sur. Good afternoon. So uh, let's, uh, any reaction from uh, first from our congressmen uh, present, then we'll go into the question and answer portion. Uh, le let me shoot the first question. You mentioned earlier, uh, 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 Chairman Popoy, that uh, the 35% uh, uh, requirement of DBM to be used for uh, COVID uh, patients and uh, other programs of uh, the government uh, is already, it, does this include the uh, so-called uh, for late release uh, of uh, the if you have in the department or in the different SUCs? This is separate from the late release. Yes, so it's this separate. Part, yes, the first thing that DBM did was to say the, for, the for later release will no longer be released. And those that you have not used, uh, those, have, those that has not been released to the agencies will be subjected now to DBM uh, action. The 35% is a requirement that in your MOOE, they will reduce it by 35, by in your MOOE, in your projects, it will be reduced by, or, 35% uh, will not be released. The funding for RA10931 will be affected by this. That is what we are worried. Because if you reduce by 35%, uh, we will not be able to fully reimburse the tuition and miscellaneous fees of state universities and colleges and not be able to release all the test money for 2020. Yes. So that is our concern. Yeah, I think this is the concern of all the departments uh, uh, in the country. Uh, if you will be, uh, you know, deducted or uh, the 35 percent will be deducted from your current budget, plus the uh, provision in the GAA that uh, we have, uh, which is the for uh, uh, late release, no, will be not be released. So this means it would not only be 35 percent; it would be more than probably 50 or 60 percent, even when you have a high percentage of your budget that uh, is indicated that there there are uh, uh, projects or programs uh, for late release. Yeah, yes, Mr. Chairman, because remember, in the 2020 budget for RA10931 was reduced in the NEP. And we ask the help of Congress of realigning money so that the money for our aid 10931 will be filled up in terms of the uh, of the gap. And this was uh, done by Congress. They realigned money to fill up the gap for our aid 10931. That money, which was realigned by Congress, is classified as for later release. So if that is not animal going to be given. As it is, the money for RA10931 is already not enough. If you do
do not release an additional 35%. We are afraid to inform Congress that we will not be able to do a lot of things for RA 10931. So two, two areas, the realignment of Congress for the, uh, for the reduction in the NEP, which is not going to be released anymore because it is labeled as for later release, and the additional 35% that will not be released for the uh, remaining money of RA 1093. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any from our, we, we have uh, Congresswoman uh, Swan Singh. Uh, can we uh, ask you to shoot your first question? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, again, good afternoon sa lahat. Uh, I would like to commend uh, Chairman Popoy de Vera for the very detailed presentation. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have uh, one concern because in the stimulus uh, bill, um, education has no budget at all. Um, unlike tourism, there's 43 billion. So how can we uh, shed that matter. Yeah, uh, it's a little, uh, in a sense, frustrating that when there are discussions on the impact of ECQ, the universities are sort of sort of become a second thought. In fact, in the uh, program of Dole for. Uh, employees who are not able to get, uh, or who will get the 5,000 assistance. The employees in private universities were also not included. The premise being that you pay the salaries of faculty members even during, uh, during summer. Medyo nakalimutan. The emphasis was on the informal sector, on workers, etc. cetera. Uh, do say stimulus package ganun din. Parang, uh, and uh, the Cocopea has submitted to uh, NEDA, has submitted to uh, the Department of Finance their proposals. We need the help of the members of Congress to push for this so that educational institutions do not become an afterthought when we talk about stimulus. Uh, we will have a separate bill that will address the education sector uh, in the country. As I've stated earlier, uh, truly, it, it was not included in the, in the stimulus package bill that was proposed, except uh, the use of the 2 billion pesos given to CHED uh, by uh, the TIESA. But it's already there, you know, you, you are using it. You can use it for whatever reason you want to, to use. No? So I think uh, we will highly consider this uh, as a major action item. And that's precisely the reason why we are here today. Uh, yes, uh, Congresswoman uh, Swansi, please uh, continue. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Uh, please, uh, let's appeal um, to the authors maybe of uh, the bill if we can include uh, education in the stimulus package. Number two, Mr. Chair, my concern is on the students. How can we um, assist the students, most especially those who are in the private schools um, where their parents um, lost their jobs or um, uh, for, for, um, students in the schools, uh, they are um, free already, their tuition, is, uh, their tuition is already free and miscellaneous. But for students, who are who who has uh, for students who have no choice but to study in the private schools? So how can the government assist them in their financial uh, requirements? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's an existing student financial assistance program under uh, RA one zero nine three one, where students can get loans, and if they pay. Student financial assistance of CHED and UNIFAST that can be accessed.
by students who need uh, money to pay tuition at least for the coming school year. There's a 1 billion uh, peso uh, fund. I was told that most of it has not been used up. So we would uh, meet with the UNIFAST as soon as possible and see whether this can be relaxed and under the Bayanihan Act uh, powers given to the national government, whether this can be prioritized for students that are affected by COVID. So merong 1 billion. Uh, we're looking to increase that amount uh, of 1 billion. But right now, that is the available money for short-term student loans. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, yes. Just a reaction, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so maybe um, I, I just uh, I feel that one billion is not enough, uh, considering the volume of the students um, who will be applying. So maybe we can also find a way for that. So, Mr. Chair, um, that's enough for the moment. Uh, I'll have the second round um, later. But before I end, I would like to express my deepest sympathy to the uh, to um, Secretary La Pena for the loss of uh, USEC Gladys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, uh, can we now call on uh, Representative Ebi Escudero for her uh, questions? Can you unmute your... Yes, that's right. Oops. Let, uh, you unmute it again. Okay, Abby, we cannot hear you yet. Or, or you can you can press the space bar, uh, Kong Abby. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, the host can unmute uh, Tita E.B. While waiting for uh, Kong Evi, okay. I would like to call on Congressman Paul Daza. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon to Secretary La Pena and Chair uh, Devera and to all our and uh, Commissioner Darilag. Uh, just to clarify, uh, Chair Devera, on the 35% MOE reduction, uh, all, all the reimbursement for tuition and the TES and other scholarship related, financial related uh, assistance is under MOE. Is that correct? Uh, well, uh, it it uh, can I ask our chief executive director because there's a separate 10% reduction of what you can spend and another 35% for projects. So uh, can we ask our Chief Executive Director to give the exact uh, amounts? Uh, can I ask uh, Attorney Haro to uh, respond? Yeah, Attorney Haro is recognized. Yes, sir. Sir, permission to speak, sir. Um, so good afternoon, at, uh, Congress uh, Chairperson Go. Um, in response to the question of uh, Congressman uh, Daza, uh, as uh, per the provision of the DBM, there will be a deduction of uh, ten percent for the C for the MOOE, ten percent for the capital outlay, and then twenty five percent for the programmed appropriation, sir. So yung mga naka-program na po, yung mga nasa PAP na po, there will be a non-release of the 35% also. Yeah. So, um, because we, we, don't, we don't have time to get to all the details, may we ask Chad to give the committee a report on the details on what the impact will be? Because um, I think when, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, because DBM wants to pool funds for the COVID response and for post-COVID, my understanding is that the spirit of what DBM, IATF, the president, and Congress wants to do is to give a priority for funding for social amelioration-related programs. So um, I'm sure most uh, 
will agree that funding for the TES, which is our tertiary uh, educational scholarship and other financial assistance programs would be considered as such. And that will be easier, I think, um, uh, Chair, Mr. Chair, for us to lobby to DBM that that should not be included in the reduction because these are all social services. So yes, can we- uh, Yeah, uh, uh, to reply to uh, Congressman Dasa, we have submitted an official letter to the DBM. Number one, uh, saying that as far as the commission is concerned, we are requesting that the reduction in the reimbursement of tuition and miscellaneous and tests be excluded. But we have also identified other projects and funds in CHED that we are ready to give up. So we have identified already those that we will no longer continue. We do not intend to continue and give up. And the negotiating that the giving up of the money will already Technically, the RA10931 money is not really is not really CHED money. It is money that passes through CHED, but it is money that is supposed to go to SUCS and LUCS. It's not we, we cannot touch that money, it just moves through CHED because to CHED. And so it is not in a sense an agency expenditure. Because if we reduce the reimbursement of tuition and miscellaneous, the operations of SOOCs will be gravely affected. Because you, if you reduce the reimbursement of tuition and miscellaneous, that is the income that they use for their maintenance, for the payment of uh, contractuals, uh, part-timers, for operations of the school, etc. The, the impact is really going to be grave on state universities and colleges. Yeah, but yeah. We, we can submit to Congress our letter to DBM. So that uh, that will be the position that we are taking. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before we continue, uh, I would like to recognize uh, Congressman uh, Bikyap of Tarlac. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. Congressman so, Mr. Yes. Chair, so having heard that, because uh, my concern is, I, I agree with Chairman De Vera. In the poorer areas, like in Region 8, in my area, what if the effect will be many students in the private colleges and our state university may end up not enrolling because if those funds are reduced, as you know, it's going to affect enrollment. So it's counterproductive. Uh, so my, if you allow me, Mr. Chair, I don't know if uh, maybe at the appropriate time, uh, Maybe the committee can, uh, we can pass a resolution or a, a motion uh, supporting uh, the, the non-reduction of the financial assistance tuition related by the DBM. So uh, we, we, we will take note of that and uh, we'll take uh, the action probably at the end of this uh, meeting, uh, Congressman Paul. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, one last thing. In the University of Eastern Philippines, which I represent, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'd like to get a um, answer from the chair. The, two, the TES funds have only been downloaded for 2018-19. 2019 and 20, I was informed, hasn't been downloaded, given to the TES scholars for the UEP, and I assume that's for the entire Region 8, and also uh, the second semester 2019-20, Tulong Dulong hasn't been distributed. I'm getting, our office is getting a lot of uh, messages and Facebook and texts and visits or district office for, from students who are asking about their, their uh, financial assistance. Yes, the, the test money for public universities is with the commission. We have downloaded it to the SOOCs and LOOCs that have complied with all requirements. But we're having a difficulty because many SOOCs have not been able to comply with the Because many of them either went skeletal or stopped going to work. Their ability to comply was also affected. But we have released to uh, 
how many have we list the uh, executive director Cindy with the list to how many sooks and looks? Sir, we were able to release um, 50, to 51 SUCs and LUCs which have complied with our documentary requirements, sir. Um, an amount of almost 400 million was already downloaded for the purpose of the payment of the test for SUCs and LUCs, sir. Yeah, because, because they, they cannot get any additional money until li they liquidate the previous money that they have. And many of them are having difficulty doing the liquidation. That is the problem. So we're looking at any other ways that can be done because if we release the money, the commission on audit will go after us. That is the problem. Well, Mr. Chair, 51 out of 113 yeah. SUCs is less than half. Yes. So it's not good because with DBM now taking away realigning funds, we need to fast track that. Now, my. Yeah. My, my request, because uh, I'd like to wrap up so the next ones can ask, could you please assign someone to specifically discuss my concerns with UEP in Region 8? Who, who would that be on the releases of this funds, compliance with documentation and all of that? Who could you assign? It will be Commissioner Darilag and Executive Director Haro, because Commissioner Darilag is the commissioner in charge of UEP. And uh, Executive Director Haro is the OIC of UNIFAST. Okay. Uh, we're asking, in fact, we've asked PASOK already for help, but we're having difficulty. Many of the universities are simply not complying with liquidation requirements. And could, yeah, could, that's could you the give, problem. Could you give us a list, the committee of the SUCs not complying with the documentation? Yes. So, 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 the, so the members can help their uh, SUCs uh, get the funds out. Yes, uh, Executive Director Haro will submit a list to the committee uh, uh, within the day, Idi Haro? Yes, sir, we are day? ready. Yes. yes, sir, we can. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we took note of uh, the request of Congressman Paul. I hope we will receive the documents uh, probably today or tomorrow. Uh, can we call now uh, Congresswoman Evi? Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah, good, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Popo de Vera. Um, ang tanong ko lang, uh, Chairman, uh, because in the SUCs, uh, marami dito na part-time teachers or lecturers uh, who are working na hindi naman sila regular faculty. Do you have any plans about their um, papano na sila? I mean, that's some of them have all this uh, ano lang ang kanilang income. And now they don't have any income anymore since the ECQ. I wonder what uh, help you're going to give them uh, at this time of um, COVID-19. Ano, COVID Meron ba tayong tulong sa kanila? Or are we just having them just stay there? Kasi wala naman silang sweldo for the time being since there are no classes. Kasi syempre, no classes, no, no salary. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, the first step we need to do is do an inventory by state university. Uh, many of them have started doing their inventory. For the SOCs, their problem is the DBM uh, circular says you cannot have... Yeah, more than... That is part of the DBM yeah. uh, uh, recommendation. So the proper, the proper step would be for the SOC to first discuss it in their respective boards on how they intend to address this problem and then bring it to the commission so that we could have a policy for all the SOCs. Pero okay. iba-iba yung situation kasi may mga SOC na malaki talaga yung number ng part-timers, meron namang konti lang. So the impact is different across the state universities. But we don't, as of, as of this moment, we don't have an assessment of the gravity of the situation. As of now. As of Pero, now. Wala. Yeah. Kasi uh, I think you will have the gravity by siguro three or four months from yes. now. Especially if you do not open soon yes. the yes. SUCs. Um, isa pa, Chairman, uh, you were saying that um, teachers should be using more or less online technology for teaching. Um, problem ko dito is like, for example, in the provinces, especially in our case, Mahina po ang aming um, internet connections. How would we go about all of this uh, educational uh, system na ngayon na uh, instead of 
students going to, to classes, they have to go into an internet um, facility, etc. Pero wala nga kaming internet facilities in the province. So how yeah. will we help the students? The uh, commission is using the term flexible learning, not yeah. online learning, because flexible includes both online and offline learning. In some of the universities during the ECQ, what the faculty members did was to develop learning packets that they gave to the students to do while they are at home. So these are take home uh, modular type activities that will compensate instead of going to the classroom, they can do it while they are at home. So that will address in some areas or in many areas, the connectivity issue. Uh, even uh, in our discussions with the ICT, uh, even in areas where the bandwidth is very weak, what can be done is to develop downloadable materials that they can download and use it in their, in their homes or on their own free time. Ang uh, problema ng connectivity is if you do full online. Because if you do live streaming, you do classes online, talagang hindi uubra ito in many areas of the country because of the connectivity issue. So the first thing we're doing is we're working with the ICT and the SOOCs to test what is their current connectivity situation. So pag alam na nila yung connectivity situation, when they, design, when they redesign their curriculum and design how much offline or online they would do, it will now be anchored on the connectivity, uh, connectivity reality. Kasi if we wait for full connectivity to happen, we really won't be able to open classes. That, 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 is, the, that is the situation. So we have to okay. adjust on what is the available connectivity. Okay, next question, Chairman. Yes. Um, yung September opening nyo, would that be very safe already? Uh, we are, uh, my, my position in the IATF is the IATF works on a 15-day increment. So I said that is the position of the commission now. Uh, but that will be subject to continuing discussion in the IATF as the health situation is further assessed. Uh, so the, we're working on it as of now. But some, okay. some, uni some universities that are doing fully online, yeah. they can actually even hold yeah. classes. Fully actually, online. they are. Yes, like Ateneo is doing summer classes online, right. St. Penil. Yeah. Yung mga yun, wala na tayong problema kasi ECQ or no but ECQ, they can do it. Yeah. But these yeah, but but these are private institutions. Yes. No? I mean uh, you and we are talking about the SUCs now. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yung SOCs, what we have done with the SOCs is we have done a Zoom session to discuss flexible learning. So okay. we've done it with the university president so they can understand the fundamental concepts, the challenges. And the next Zoom session that we will have next week is a discussion on how to establish a learning management system. We're presenting to the presidents both the, the uh, free, uh, free system and the proprietary system. I think it is Mapua who will be doing the Zoom session next week to uh, explain to the university presidents how they set up their learning management system using proprietary. That so, means, uh, Chairman, that means, Chairman, that uh, you're going to have all the faculty members change their syllabus, their curriculum, etc. Uh, and that would be, uh, give, you have to give them time for this, I guess. Yes, yes. yes. So, so in other words... Because it's not uh, easy to, to prepare all these uh, uh, kind of uh, changes. You love what? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Chairman Devera. Thank you. Uh, in other words, uh, you are giving the option to the different SUCs to decide which approach they will take but ensuring that the quality of education will remain in the various SUCs. Mr. Chair. Uh, Popo. Yes, and uh, they must comply with the uh, health protocols and standards and discuss with their local government. Kasi ang problema, ang, ang isang situation dito sa si ECQ that is problematic is how the local governments operate. Kasi pag naghigpit yung local governments, you know, even if you try to do a little bit of the residential mode, you really can't have any residential mode if public transportation is not available. So they, exactly. they really have to consult with local governments the whole time. Okay. Uh, do we have uh, other question, or uh, probably we can ask uh, 
our next uh, resource person to present. Then Mr. after Tesla, Chair. Chair, Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair. Tesla, Mr. Yes. Chair. Uh, we have uh, our Director General, uh, Sid uh, La Pena, who will uh, present uh, the situation in the uh, uh, technical educational uh, program at the government. So can we call now? Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Mr. Have, Chair. Yeah, OK, please. I was the one. Uh, Sino? Sino sa kanila? Sino? Mr. Chair? Yes. Be okay. Before we leave, uh, yes. before we leave, uh, Chair, um, I have one question uh, for um, uh, Chairman Popoy. Um, Chairman, um, this is about the grading system because of the kind of learning and teaching that we have. Uh, because my daughter is, um, they're having a, a online learning. So whenever they have uh, test questions, the teacher tends to give difficult uh, questions be just to avoid them for cheating. So what happened was the school decided that it will no longer be a number grading or a letter grading but it's pass or fail. So do you, um, do you consider that? Because uh, for the, especially for the SOOPs, because that's under your authority. So do you have plans of, um, of migrating to that kind of grading system? Uh, that is covered by the academic freedom, the exercise of academic freedom by faculty members and by universities, yung grading system, requirements, etc. cetera. Uh, the, we leave that to the universities, but we tell them that your decisions on the grading system must not unduly disadvantage students because it depends on the degree programs offered. There's a wide variety of degree programs offered by your universities. You usually give a pass or fail if you don't have enough basis to grade. But the requirements per degree program are quite different. And so there, there should be no unilateral decision that will cobble everyone and disadvantage others. A pass or fail grade. It affects, for example, students who are looking or who are, who are going after Latin honors. Those who want to be cum laudes, magna cum laudes, summa cum laudes. You know, a cum laude or summa cum laude after your name determines uh, what happens with the rest of your life. And uh, if we unduly, you know, take that away from students, we are disadvantaging them. There are those under scholarship who need a GPA to maintain their scholarship. There are those who need grades to go to medical school or to graduate school. So we say, consult with your students because academic freedom is not an exclusive prerogative of faculty members. When you exercise academic freedom, it must be in consultation with the students. Because when you started the semester, your agreement was numeric grades. And your agreement was you're going to have X number of, of exams and how the grade will be computed. Any unilateral change in the agreement of of universities to do, but they must do it with extreme care and caution. Thank you. Okay. So uh, it's good to know that that is possible because um, there are other, uh, there are some universities that are, they, they consult their uh, students and then the students that are running for, for honors, they uh, chose um, the, 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 number grading. So um, it's good to know, um, Chairman uh, Popoy, that it, that is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, can we hear uh, uh, our uh, Director General of PESDA, uh, Secretary Sid La Peña, please. Uh, honorable Chairman and the uh, members of this uh, Honorable Committee, the Committee on Higher and Technical Education, Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Uh, I am with uh, 
two uh, of my deputies, uh, Deputy uh, Director General uh, Rose uh, Ordaneta and Deputy Director General uh, Rina Sarmiento and uh, Executive Director Marisa Ligaspi. And before uh, I start with my briefing, I would like to thank uh, Congresswoman uh, Swan Singh for uh, his uh, statement of sympathy for the passing away of uh, our Deputy Director General Gladys uh, Rosales. Indeed, uh, she passed away uh, while performing her official uh, function duties, attending uh, to uh, meetings uh, despite, uh, the, uh, despite the risk uh, of the uh, coronavirus that time. So uh, she passed away uh, April 3. Uh, the uh, first uh, symptom appeared uh, on uh, March 17, two days after uh, the, uh, the uh, enhanced, uh, enhanced community quarantine was declared. And um, uh, barely two weeks, uh, she passed away. But uh, uh, she deserves to be uh, given a tribute uh, for what uh, she had been doing without fear without fear of the uh, coronavirus, kahit na ano yung mga inaatindaran niya, uh, she went on to perform her duties and responsibilities. Maraming salamat po, uh, Congresswoman Swansing, for uh, the uh, expression of sympathy. So without, uh, may I now uh, proceed uh, with uh, our uh, presentation? Uh, well, uh, uh, I would like to thank the, uh, the, uh, the committee uh, for giving us this opportunity to uh, render our report on uh, the uh, or the technical vocational education and training situation, what uh, TESDA has been doing or uh, what TESDA has done and has been doing during the uh, the enhanced uh, community quarantine and a way forward, our way forward. And uh, indeed, uh, the coronavirus uh, has uh, made our our uh, our uh, Tibet, uh, our Tibet, uh, very difficult. In fact, it has changed uh, many programs that are uh, for implementation. But uh, it's something that uh, we can, that uh, uh, we are not prepared of. In fact, uh, nobody uh, expected this. Uh, even the powerful countries are uh, also. So uh, we just have to uh, to, to do uh, things uh, that. Uh, uh, adapting to the situation. And uh, so we did uh, several action uh, uh, during, uh, uh, during the enhanced, uh, enhanced uh, community quarantine while uh, preparing uh, for, uh, for the uh, way forward. And um, without much ado, my request uh, to make the, um, the presentation for TESDA. So, um, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Secretary La Peña, and magandang hapon po sa lahat. With the permission of uh, Secretary La Peña, please allow me to present the TESDA uh, report for this committee. Share ko lang po muna. So as mentioned po that uh, the coronavirus has really now posed uh, a more serious downside risk to all sectors and the global economy, including the Philippines. Uh, President Rodrigo, Rodrigo Duterte has imposed the enhanced community quarantine and stringent social distancing and other precautionary measures in the various parts of the country, including especially the NCR effective uh, last March 17 and was extended up to May 15, 2020. Recently, this coverage has uh, been uh, updated and improvements are observed in certain areas. The International Labor Organization report last April 7 stated that the COVID-19 pandemic has intensified and expanded in terms of its global reach full or partial lockdowns, measures, travel restrictions, and business disruptions are now affecting almost uh, 2.7 billion workers, representing around 81% of the world's 
workforce. In the Philippines, the Department of Labor and Employment has reported that more than 1 million workers are affected by this crisis. And uh, so it is uh, the, the major concern now we are facing are food, health, and job security for which TESDA would like to contribute. So following the president's pronouncement, uh, TESDA has issued the necessary mem memorandum circulars uh, effect, in fact, as early as March 13 and March 17, declaring that uh, all classes in uh, both public and private uh, institutions in the Metro Manila and those covered by the uh, declaration are immediately suspended. And uh, given these uh, measures, we can characterize our Tibet situation as follows. So there is suspension of all training and assessment activities nationwide. The implementation of all our scholarship programs have been stopped, and this will adversely deprive our target beneficiaries of the opportunities and also affect the expected uh, output and fund utilization uh, for year 2020. On a positive note, however, there is an expansion of the TESDA online program being in existence since uh, May, 12, uh, May 2012. The promotion of the TESDA online program was intensified to make uh, Filipino citizens more productive during the enhanced quarantine period. So the TESDA online program is uh, available not only for students, but for all individuals who are interested to access this program. Currently, our TESDA online program offers a total of 68 online courses available at the eTESDA learning portal where students and other individuals can access courses and materials. And this include the areas of agriculture, automotive, electronics, entrepreneurship, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, human uh, and healthcare information and communications technology, lifelong learning skills, maritime, social and community services, and uh, te technical vocational education and training. So enrollees under the TOP continue to increase at an average of 1,300 registered users per day. The promotion of this program has attracted significant attention which affects the capacity of the system. So uh, in terms of employment uh, impact, we have seen that uh, this will affect both the trainers and assessors in the Tibet sectors. Uh, and I will give the details later. In, uh, in terms of the industry sectors, uh, there are sectors that will be negatively affected, particularly tourism, education and training, transportation and construction, at least for the period of the ECQ. However, there are also sectors that can uh, benefit or can be maximized. And this is, this is in the area of the information and communication technology because of the uh, use of the online platforms and the demand for more uh, e-services. Agriculture, uh, the, dis the disruption caused by the pandemic is being experienced and in the whole world and uh, this uh, directs a country to strengthen the agriculture sector to ensure the availability and sufficiency of for the people. Health and wellness, the medical assistance is the most critical sector in addressing the pandemic and uh, not only medical professionals are being tapped to provide assistance, but even barangay health workers, especially for the LGUs. The pharmaceutical industry is also booming during this time as people are concerned in boosting the immune system and likewise the search for vaccine and medicine. The, the manufacturing sector, at least for the basic essentials, uh, uh, there is a demand and we expect that this will also uh, continue as uh, quarantine is limited. Then the logistics along with the ma manufacturing industry uh, is the need uh, for transport and uh, for to deliver these goods and services to those uh, requiring them. So going into the details, uh, 
as of March 31, 2020, we have a total of uh, 3,329 uh, competency assessors that are affected, and that represents 38.31% because uh, totally our competency assessment has, uh, has been suspended because most of our assessment uh, is conducted face-to-face. -face. And uh, these uh, assessors are being utilized in um, 2,085 assessment centers, majority of which, or 93.72%, are private assessment centers. Uh, so uh, we have received requests uh, also for assistance from these affected assessors. But uh, at this point, our budget uh, or our authority to spend the budget is limited to our training and assessment services. So what we have done is to refer them uh, and to ask assistance from the DOLE and to refer them to, to the uh, COVID uh, adjustment measures programs of the DOLE and also for the social am amelioration fund. Uh, some TVIs are also considering the adoption of online or blended learning methodology for its operations. And this is uh, part of the plan that we are moving forward. So this table shows the uh, details of uh, distribution of affected uh, competence, number of competency assessors by region, the largest of which, of course, goes to NCR, uh, registering 46% of the total uh, of the total uh, assessors. Now, the, the next table shows uh, the distribution of assessment centers by region. And as you can see, 93.72% of this uh, are, are private assessment centers. And uh, a majority also are in the national capital region. Now, in terms of uh, impact on employment, uh, we are talking about a total of more uh, 4,400, uh, 4,044 public and pri uh, private institutions uh, with uh, 16,000, with 24,227 registered uh, or national uh, Tibet uh, trainer certificate holders. Uh, out of the, we uh, we are uh, the, all these private institutions are affected by this COVID pandemic. So all the uh, trainers and uh, staff of these private institutions are affected. We have a total of uh, 303 programs based on the rapid assessment that was done by TESDA. We have a total of 303 programs and 171 TVIs that are closed due to lack of enrollment from January to March. And uh, we will have uh, the final result by end of April on the, uh, of this rapid assessment. To date, uh, we have uh, received responses from 800. So this is the distribution of our uh, National Tibet Trainers uh, Certificate Holders. These are the authorized Tibet trainers uh, that deliver training out in our public and private institutions. But note that uh, not all these trainers are permanent uh, employees of the TVI. Some of them are uh, on call or on a project-based basis. So, and uh, all of them, whether permanent or contractual workers are without work, except for the public uh, event trainers, those especially those that are employed in our own test the technology institutions. So in terms of uh, uh, impact on our funds, uh, we have uh, realigned, uh, or this uh, is the total fund that was not released already by DBM. This is part of the for later release 
uh, and this has been contributed to the social amelioration program. And that amounts to 2.10 billion. And this came from the Tulong Trabaho Scholarship Program with 1.015 billion. Uh, uh, a certain amount of uh, from our test the uh, training for work scholarship program at 875 million, uh, 200 million for the special training for employment, and 10 million for Kabuhayan, Barangay Kabuhayan Skills Training Program. So from these slush funds, we are estimating that 116 scholarship slots or scholars will be affected. So, but the remaining funds of uh, 6.58 billion that we have are being prioritized to address the immediate needs of the national government under this uh, COVID pandemic. And these are, uh, these include the following, uh, continuing production of PPEs and other health related products related to COVID, training and other assistance related to food security and its support industries, uh, a planned stimulus training package and other assistance to affected sectors during this crisis, especially workers that will be displaced in MSMEs, our returning OFWs, the IP communities, and other marginalized sectors under uh, covered under EO70. And also the need for capacity building programs for our trainers uh, uh, to shift them to the delivery of more flexible training uh, arrangements, including online and blended learning systems. So in terms of uh, numbers, these are the affected uh, scholars uh, because of uh, this pandemic, both because of the suspension of classes and later on with the reduction of budget. So. Uh, before the pandemic, we have uh, ongoing uh, training uh, or scholarship program, and these numbers took 44,438. So when the suspension was uh, declared, all of them have stopped schooling and will continue on uh, after the ECQ, or we are also assessing whether some of the programs can be delivered blended or online. So if purely online, then we will that would be authorized. So those are the things that we studied. We are also looking at 7,725 uh, scholars under the UAQT or uh, the test component of the UAQT, as well as the future enrollees at 157,515. So we have, uh, calculated our targets based on the reduction of budget. And as you can see, we, our target or from the original has been reduced by 52% because of the slash in the budget that uh, will be, uh, the slash in the budget that were taken from TESDA. That's 2.10 billion representing 25, is 25% of the total scholarship budget that we have. Now, uh, as mentioned, we have seen a positive uh, response to the test the online program. And uh, based on our monitoring uh, during the uh, pandemic uh, period, that is when the uh, declaration of the quarantine was made, we have 82,977 new top users, making a total of 201,928 active users for the whole period. So effectively, while, uh, uh, while we say uh, training has been suspended, there are still ongoing training program through the TESDA online program. At the same time, our TESDA technology institution has also continued training, especially those in the areas that are not covered by the enhanced uh, community quarantine. And they, it's our TESDA technology institutions that continue to uh, do the face-to-face -face training, observing the, all the necessary health protocols prescribed by IATF. And they are responsible for producing uh, all the assistance that were, uh, were given by TESDA to the frontliners and our uh, other personnel who are involved in this uh, 
securing a peace and order also in that area. We continue to provide also even for IP communities who have provided uh, these services. Uh, so in summary, this uh, is the total figure that we have as of the data, and this is continuing. Uh, 239,632 face masks, uh, 22,000 face shields, 2,726 protective suits, 60 goggles, uh, sanitizers, and some of our training institutions are also developing prototypes for uh, ventilators uh, and also portable uh, wash uh, laboratories. Uh, so innovations are also being observed among our TESDA technology institutions. So, uh, TESDA has been preparing immensely to resume training as an assessment activities once these are allowed uh, by the authorities. But given that there is no imminent vaccine to be developed and deployed in the foreseeable future, TESDA and its workforce will be living, working and operating with the COVID-19 environment. Thus, given the current and emerging situation in the country, we have crafted the TESDA operations plan to guide our activities, and we anchor this operations plan on the following. Uh, the NEDA has proposed a three-phase approach to mitigate the social and uh, economic impact of the coronavirus, and we have adapted uh, uh, on a modified basis these three phases. We call phase one as the survival phase, which focuses primarily on health-related efforts to curb the effects of the virus, and this covers the period March 17 to April uh, to April 30. Then phase two, the transitional phase focuses on rebuilding consumer and business confidence uh, that will last until uh, end of June. And then uh, phase three will involve the resumption of the new normal state of economic activity that will uh, be uh, for the period 2021 to 2022. So this figure is based on the reference that we got from the IATF. Of course, this will be modified accordingly given the new declaration of uh, uh, extension uh, to May 15 of the ECQ as well as even the protocols that will be observed along this line. So under the test the operations plan, the agency aims to train and prepare to live, work, and operate within the COVID-19 environment. TESDA shifts its focus to contribute to the nation's food security and be able to adapt to a new normal state in carrying out its mandate in providing skills to Filipinos and a job and livelihood after. We call our TESDA operations plan as TESDA about lahat, pivot towards a new normal. So in accordance to the three-phase program of intervention proposal for the mitigation of the social and economic impact of COVID-19, uh, uh, this operations plan is covered under the, uh, it's anchored on the three phases mentioned earlier. So the following can consideration shall guide the, uh, the implementation of our uh, operations plan about test about lahat. One is to provide support in ensuring food security, availability, for affordability by capacitating communities to become food production sites, provide support to communities to build their capacities in preventing and suppressing further transmission of COVID-19 virus and responding to other health concerns, address the needs of the disadvantaged vulnerable sectors by providing the necessary sectoral uh, basic uh, services, especially skills training, in which the actions of the government are sector sensitive as to their sectoral needs. Maintain the economic st stability of each region by capacitating the MSMEs and supporting their skills uh, requirements. Assure industries with ready quality workforce by producing competent and re work ready individuals devise innovative means of implementing Tibet programs and services and consider the value chain approach in as such and ensure that all TESDA personnel and 
are trained to work and adapt to the COVID-19 environment and also assure the continuity of aging agency's mandate and achievement of targets by the end of the year. Is that okay already? All right, uh, continue lang, sir. Okay. So, uh, so the, our offline uh, uh, objectives are uh, anchored on TESDA's mandates. One is ensuring that our policies and plans are relevant to the new normal, and that we will develop innovative and flexible regulatory programs that are adapted to this new environment and the changing needs of the TVET sector. And we will design and implement innovative and accessible TSD programs that needs, meet the needs and strengthen the requirements. The change is now, uh, is how, in how training and learning will be delivered under the new protocols will, will of course require support for News for our for this system, and this will include the recognition of prior learning, our adoption, our intensifying our portfolio assessment, online assessment, capacity building, as well as uh, support for ICT related uh, services. And in fact, we are looking at uh, also the need for uh, massive investment in ICT infrastructure, especially now that we are moving towards. Uh, maximizing the use of technology uh, in the delivery of training and assessment. So we have already crafted and uh, later the details of which are in our operations plan and uh, which can uh, be uh, looked at eventually. So yung lang po, marami salamat, uh, Mr. Chair and Secretary. Uh, th thank you, thank you very much, uh, Director Lugaspi. Uh, before we uh, continue, I would like to uh, introduce the other members of uh, Congress uh, who are present. We have uh, Representative uh, Joe Garcia of the 2nd District of Bataan. Uh, we have also Congresswoman uh, Maricel Natividad Dagano of the 4th District of Nueva Ecija. Uh, so, siguro, before we continue with the question and answer part, uh, I would like to ask uh, the uh, President of the Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges, uh, PASOK, as well as the President of COCOPEA and uh, also the ALCOCOA. Uh, we'll start with the Director uh, Tirso Ronquillo of PASOK to come out with uh, his presentation. Yes, uh, Director Ronquillo. Oh, yes. Dr. Ronquillo, yes. Can you unmute your... Okay, so good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Go of CHT and uh, Chair DiBero of CHED and all other commissioners who are present, the members of the CHT, to all of you. Uh, magandang hapon po. Our uh, staff from PASOK will share on screen the presentation. While uh, Chairperson De Vera already had uh, presented the uh, glimpse of what uh, Chad is doing or uh, coordinating with our SUSCs with regards to COVID pandemic, I uh, would like to present some details on the uh, status of state universities as we respond to this uh, COVID-19. Next slide. Uh, we have seen the effect of COVID-19 in all sectors and undeniably higher education, particularly SUSCs are affected by this uh, pandemic. In the next slide, we can see the, uh, next slide. Uh, who is at stake? We have 112 state universities all over the country, including 430 satellite campuses with around 1.3 million students enrolled in our system. We have 70,000 faculty and staff 
35,000 of which is uh, faculty members, 25,000 of which are admin staff, and uh, 10,000 of which are guest lecturers. 25, we have nearly 26,000 job orders and contract of uh, service workers. And we have around 300,000 graduates this year whose employment prospect becomes uncertain. So this is the general uh, scenario in our state universities and the number of faculty, staff, and uh, students who will be affected, who are getting affected of this COVID-19. In the next slide, uh, I would like to present uh, briefly the summary of what state universities are doing. And we have already, uh, this was presented by uh, Chair De Vera. Uh, in summary, we have 53 of our SUCs who are uh, making face masks and face shields. 13 SUCs are designed misting and disinfecting boots that were stationed in checkpoints and geographical boundaries of their communities and 41 of our state universities from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao uh, produce alcohol and other disinfectants. 19 of our SUCs produce and donated full sets of uh, PPEs in different hospitals. In the next slide, 10 SUCs uh, provided financial assistance to students stranded in dormitories, and uh, four SUCs offer the use of our facilities as lodging facility for medical frontliners. 39 SUCs already uh, delivered food packs to uh, students stranded in our dormitories. And uh, six SUCs provided transportation services. And uh, 10 of us uh, made uh, infographics and educational materials, while four SUCs offered medical services for patients during COVID-19 pandemic. In the next slide, let us uh, present, or let me present to you the uh, impact of this COVID-19, some of the felt impact to our students. The full online learning education is not feasible due to limitation of electronic equipment and internet connectivity among students, especially those residing in rural areas in many of our campuses. Stranded students and faculty members are still in the campus due to lockdown. There is no allotted budget for this pandemic situation for the daily foods and needs of those stranded. So currently what we're doing is we are mobilizing uh, our student council, even our PTA, even our alumni association for the fund drive so that we can support our stranded students in our dormitories. Economic incapacity of parents to support students' financial needs in the case of the Samsung of classes. While many of us or some of us already ended the semesters or the second semester, still many of us are uh, intending or have planned to resume the classes or the, the semester, the second semester once the ECQ is lifted. Now, our problem is the incapacity of some of our, many of our students because they belong to the family whose uh, economic uh, uh, support is also challenged. Universities have OJT students affected by ECQ and are currently stranded in places outside the region and some who are located outside the country. The pandemic may increase the number of dropout students for the reason that may be forced to look for job to help their family is the financial difficulty and instability brought by ECQ. Later, I'll be presenting the projected number of students who will be affected by this. In the next slide, for faculty and staff, how our faculty and staff are affected by this COVID pandemic, some faculty members don't have the exposure or experience on using educational application and has no training to facilitate distance learning. Uh, payments of salaries of faculty members, including those who work as part-time instructors or lecturers, casual and contractual during the extension of classes. Establishing compensation parameters for job orders and contractual workers, and inclusion of the SUC's job order contract of workers and, their low, and other low-income earners as recipients of the social amelioration program. This is our prayers 
that the job orders and contact of service workers in our SUCs be also included in the social amelioration programs. Next slide. For administration, not all SUCs are well equipped to implement school-wide online learning modalities due to limited ICT facility and, of course, challenge in funding. Delayed implementation of planned activities which will surely affect budget utilization rate, organizational targets, and overall performance in all the purple functions of universities, including instruction, research, extension, and production. Our challenge also is how to meet the deliverables as stated in the 2020 GAA targets, especially the infrastructure projects. <coughs> as written in and, and mentioned also by the chair, uh, our infrastructure project will be affected by the recent release uh, DBM uh, NBC 580 because the 35% uh, deduction in the appropriation for our capital outlay is really a big challenge. Mr. Chair, I would like, of course, to manifest that uh, the uh, infrastructure project includes even ICT infrastructure in some of our SUCs, which we are already, uh, which will really uh, needed as we face to transition to this uh, flexible learning. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we also have query on granting and charging of leave credits during this period of ECQ. Uh, as we all know, uh, many of our staff or a number of our staffs are even deployed uh, during uh, even the enhanced community quarantine to act as a skeletal workforce. Our challenge also is the limited classroom space to accommodate our students uh, observing physical distancing. Insufficient fund and time constraint to establish platform for automation of transaction in offices. So that's our challenge now, to uh, establish a platform to automate these offices. Because if we will resort to work from home arrangement, the challenge is the readiness of our offices and our SUCs to adapt to this uh, ICT enabled uh, working environment. Use of SUC facilities, classrooms as quarantine area will greatly affect even the resumption of classes and operation of SUCs because as reported by the chair, a number of our SUCs are already being uh, used or utilized as quarantine areas. So if this uh, COVID pandemic will uh, escalate, our challenge now is when classes resume, our uh, classrooms will not be available because of this uh, challenge. Providing mobility services and transportation for skeletal workforce who do not have personal vehicles as we need to continue the services to our stakeholders in the university during this ECQ, we need to deploy this skeletal workforce. Now the challenge is the uh, transportation services for them. Providing adequate medical facilities, equipment and supplies which can aid the needs of students and employees in times of health emergency is also a challenge among us SUCs. In the next slide, I have here the, uh, uh, some data and statistics that we have gathered in the past few days. Uh, for the SUCs to participate in this around 100 of us, 41 SUCs uh, project a decline of enrollment for the forthcoming uh, school year, or nearly 45%. And as projected, around 59,000 students will be dropping out or not enrolling. And uh, 26,849 personnel, this is the number of job orders and contract of service before ECQ with an estimated budget of 5 billion a year. Now, uh, because of the uh, DBM circular, we have uh, estimated 7,171 personnel. This is the number of projected uh, job orders who may not be renewed if total ban on hiring job orders will be implemented because that is specified in the uh, uh, DBM and BC 580 that hiring of job order workers, except those frontliners, will be prohibited. Now, uh, we have uh, an estimate of uh, 1.89 billion. This is the project budget needed to renew these uh, job orders or contract of service. 
subject to further verification because in our data, this is for 92 SUCs. And we need this 1.89 billion to continue the uh, rehiring of our job orders. As we all know, Mr. Chair, our challenge is the manpower in our university when classes resume because we don't have enough plantilla or item uh, staff in our universities. Uh, as we all know, uh, the admin staff that supports our uh, operation are mostly job order workers because the limitation on the plantilla items in the government, especially in SUCs, so that our operation will be uh, greatly hampered when job order workers will not be uh, rehired anymore. Uh, in the next slide, uh, there are around 9,887 uh, students uh, stranded in our campuses and uh, estimating that they will be needing 200 peso a day allowance for them to survive. We have uh, estimated that around uh, uh, 2 million will be needed to feed all of them on a daily basis. Uh, 4 billion, this is the estimated financial losses or setbacks due to pandemic. This is revenues from various IGPs in our SUCs. So we estimate around 4 billion will be uh, uh, our loss in our IGPs. From 79 SUCs, which comprise 86%, this is uh, the SUCs who already sent uh, billing for the reimbursement of our uh, tuition fees. But at the moment, there, are only, there is only one SUC who was already paid by Unipass for the second semester uh, billing. This is the data that we gathered from 92 SUCs. Next slide. Uh, on estimated financial losses, it must be added uh, the 18 billion capital outlays included in the program appropriations of 112 SUCs that may be discontinued in view of the prevailing conditions set forth in the NBC 580. Most of the 18 billion capital outlays were included in the four later release allotment under the 2020 GAA. This will greatly affect the infrastructure development program of SUCs, including the necessary IT infrastructures and support facilities that we will be needing as we shift to this new normal. More pressing is the required 10% reduction in the total release allotment of SUCs and directed to be no longer available for obligation during this year. This would also mean discontinuance of direct or certain program activities and projects that would ensure ease and facility in the delivery of education services. Uh, in the next slide, of the 86 SUCs who responded in this uh, quick survey, most of the SUCs are intending to end their second semester of AY 2019-2020 between mid-May to mid-June. Only five SUCs have ended or are ending their semester this April 2020, while there are eight SUCs who plan to extend their semester for one month until the end of June. Uh, there is a consensus among SUCs that there will be, uh, there will, there will no be face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, classes anymore. And uh, we will just uh, end the semester beyond uh, April. But instead of opting the alternative method to allow the students to comply with the course requirements for the semester and give the faculty enough basis to give grades to students. Uh, we vow in our approach as uh, written in our academic freedom for faculty members and university and even students. So as we all know, before the ECQ, some of our students or almost all of our SUCs have records of our students. So when we continue our semester, it depends on the additional requirements that the faculty members might be requiring from our students. So we even advise our SUCs to somehow relax or give leniency on the grading systems that they have in our SUCs so that our students will be able to cope up with the requirement of their respective courses. In the next slide, <clears throat> most SUCs will be calibrating their grading system as we have agreed. A numerical rating shall be given based on the performance of the students before the ACQ in compliance with the minimum course requirements. Now on policies, waive and consideration given, 
as all SUCs adopted alternative flexible learning method for the remainder of the second semester, they adjusted some of its academic policies on grading system, scholastic standing, dropping of subjects, student retention, and considerations were given on thesis, OJT, deadlines, and course requirements. So we extended the uh, deadlines on the submission of course requirements. And even the uh, uh, student retentions or completion of their incomplete grades were given due consideration in our respective SUCs. All SUCs who responded in the survey said they are planning to open the next semester uh, in August, but pending the directive issued by Malacanang and the uh, advisory of the Commission on Higher Education and other concerned local government. On shaping the post-COVID-19 world and resilience in higher education, the country has taken the COVID-19 pandemic seriously. Increasingly, SUCs are actively participating in joining efforts of the government to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Some of the faculty members are striving to participate in high-end research towards finding vaccination or cure for the virus. Many are continuously collaborating and communicating with their international counterparts to help each other overcome the effect of this pandemic. On shaping the post-COVID-19 world to continue, in light of the Industry 4.0, Education 5.0, and Society 5.0, some universities have already begun making the shift to new normal that is using new modes of technology mediated and technology enhanced teaching and assessment, nano courses, etc. Higher education institutions may start to consider adopting the blended learning method or approach in order to ensure efficient continuity of classes in case of emergencies. Adoption of mixed methods, blended mode of instructional delivery may be considered and is being considered. There may be a shift from residential to mixed modes of instructional depending on the capacity and the capability of both faculty and students. This may be used depending on the readiness of faculty, students' geographical residence, and availability of electronic or internet infrastructure and system. <clears throat> At the current state, the message is clear that there is no going back to old normal traditional classroom as we know it now. Pasok to the researchers of Batanga State University is doing a research on the uh, connectivity of our students in all our SUCs in different campuses that we have. Because as we all know, majority of our campuses in the far south or even in the far north don't have access to the internet. So PASOK now is doing research on the uh, viability of uh, having the internet connectivity in cooperation of course or coordination of course to the local telco in the respective locality. Okay, so Mr. Chair, so this is uh, the uh, so far the uh, situation in our respective SUCs and rest assured that our respective SUCs together with our faculty and administrative staff will continue to support the government in the best way we can so that we together heal as one. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, our uh... Uh, Dr. Doc, uh, uh, Tirso Ronquillo for your uh, presentation. Uh, I, you know, I miss kanina si uh, General La Peña. Uh, he might have some closing message, uh, uh, Director La Peña. Meron po kayong closing message after the presentation of uh, Director uh, Gaspi. Paki-unmute lang po. Um, wala na, Your Honor. Salamat po. Mag ano lang po tayo. After these uh, two more uh, presentations, uh, I would like to call now uh, Dr. Raimundo Arcega of Alcocoa uh, to make uh, his presentation. Dr. Arcega? Yes. Um, a pleasant afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, and to the rest of the members of the committee on higher and technical education. Um, allow me to share with you uh, our response mechanism in local colleges via PowerPoint presentation.
Um, our presentation, <clears throat> our presentation, uh, of course, is uh, in support uh, of the presentation of the Commission on Higher Education to our dear chairman, uh, Popoy De Vera, and the rest of the officials of SHED. Uh, in brief, allow me to uh, share with you LCU's response mechanism to COVID-19 pandemic. Um, immediately after the extension of the quarantine, in the zone and in the rest of the parts of the country. Uh, we were uh, forced to meet all local colleges and universities in the Philippines. Uh, current LCU statistics, uh, we have right now 106 LCUs in the Philippines. Um, out of 106, 100, 103 are uh, beneficiaries of the UNIFAS program. Out of 106, 75 are, are ALCO members. And out of 106, 54 are Alcohoa members. And out of 106, 21 are accredited institutions of Alcohoa. It is also worthy to mention additional statistics as mentioned by uh, Chairman Rivera. Out of 106 LCUs, 18 right now have been utilized as quarantine and used for other related services. It may not be exactly a quarantine, but some frontliners are being housed in some. Uh, LCU uh, facilities. Another um, statistics that's worth also to mention that more or less 80% of local colleges out of 106 implemented the new prescribed school calendar by the Commission on Higher Education. That means out of 80% um, already shifted to um, school year starting August until May of the following year, while the remaining 20% uh, have been in the old calendar meaning from June to March. Um, that means right now, those who have ended their classes last March uh, may not have been so much affected, except if they have summer. And uh, those who, who will be ending in June will start maybe August or September of the ensuing school year. Another uh, important data, which has been emphasized already by our PASO president, Dr. Ronquillo, and even by Ched, majority of our students have no device and or connectivity, thus there is what you call digital divide. But we would like to thank, um, allow me to share with you the else from, from all these numbers, um, we have this LCU response framework. Um, how are we, LCUs have been affected, particularly in four major areas, in terms of governance and administration. We were affected also in terms of curriculum and instruction. Third, we were also affected on areas of students' development. And finally, um, not that we were affected, but uh, this COVID-19 pandemic became our opportunity for research and community extension. So to the honorable members of the Meet on Higher and Technical Education, our response is anchored on four major areas, governance, administration, curriculum, students' development, research, and community extension and allow us to present to you our uh, strategic action. It's been our response to COVID-19 pandemic on areas of governance administration. Um, it motivated um, local colleges to realign its budget, its annual investment plan. Um, there's maybe for some LCS, they don't have so much budget on IT and on other online resources. So we've advised um, our local colleges to revisit the approved annual investment plan, try to find out how they can realign the budget to be able to support uh, the government's call, particularly of CHED, to embrace flexible learning, blended and uh, seamless learning. Second, um, we have to uh, fund faculty trainings on online instructions and blended learning. Um, there has been trainings uh, designed not COVID-19 related. So we have to make use of these budgets converted to training programs that would definitely address uh, issues relating to faculty development and competencies. We have to agree that not all faculty today are um, IT enabled or are even ready uh, to embrace flexible learning, um, digital learning or online learning. 
Uh, another item under governance, um, we have to come up also with incentive and rewards for participating academic staff who embrace flexible learning consensuously. Um, also, we have to collaborate with the city and barangay officials, as well as other stakeholders in the deployment of instructional program and materials. Earlier, it was mentioned that not all students have device and connectivity. Uh, based on our survey, some have device and connectivity, but there are only a few numbered. Uh, majority have device, but no connectivity. And there are also number of students who have no device and at the same time, no connectivity. And the only way for us to reach them under flexible learning would be um, to bring the uh, instructional materials, maybe through their uh, barangays, to be able for them to finish the current uh, semester. And uh, we've also requested um, local colleges and universities to submit um, reports to us uh, for eventual transmission to uh, transmittal to CHED through Alco and Alcohoa. We have to uh, help CHED monitor um, 106 local universities in the country. And uh, we have been involved in the different government and NGOs initiated survey. Uh, it's worth it to mention that we received uh, a survey form from the Committee on Higher and Technical Education of Congressman Go, uh, I guess a week ago. And we also received um, uh, survey uh, uh, questions from the Commission on Higher Education. And there are also private companies been trying to send a uh, um, survey form uh, with the promise that they'll be sharing with us the results of uh, statistics in uh, realigning our academic offerings. And of course, um, we have to implement new normal protocols uh, upon resumption of classes. The second area, curriculum and instruction, uh, in support of TED Advisory 1 to 6. In fact, we waited until the issuance of Advisory 6 to be able for us to realize uh, what are applicable uh, in the local colleges and universities. And uh, in addition to, or maybe a little uh, enhancement of CHED, uh, flexible learning, we come together to implement seamless, blended, and digital learning program um, what makes seamless different from the two others? Um, kasi ho may mga provincial local colleges na mahina ho talaga ang internet at may mga bata ho talagang walang cellphone or walang laptop. Pero hindi ho kasi po pwede na hindi sila mararating ng education service in the mid of COVID-19 pandemic. So when we say seamless, uh, we have to collaborate and we have to be in partnership with the barangay officials. Um, to be able for us to reach our students who are not situated in the same location in our desire to bring uh, education to them, uh, specifically those that are still implementing uh, the course offerings for the second semester. Um, second, uh, on curriculum and instruction, um, I guess seamless blended and digital, uh, we've conducted, we've advised local colleges to conduct uh, institutional survey to determine the current status of uh, our students. The survey will tell us who among from our students in real numbers have device and connectivity. Uh, the survey will allow us to identify who have device says but no connectivity. And the survey will allow us to realize who have no devices and connectivity. Uh, only after the survey, that's the third action we, we would advise everyone to take in LCUs, create academic plan, but academic plan drawn from the survey results. So for those who have devices and connectivity, strong connectivity, um, when it's practical, economic, and convenient, they can continuously have online classroom, synchronous, meaning they can attend classes just like what we're doing right now, all at the same time. But for those who have devices and no connectivity, but they can just see the internet once a week or twice a week, we're recommending for online would be for us to send um, uh, hard copies of uh, our materials to be able to share uh, learnings with our students. The fourth one under curriculum and instruction would be to formulate comprehensive policy on seamless blended and digital learning. It has been emphasized the respective vice president for academic affairs 
in charge of formulating guidelines, program implementation, and monitoring. The fifth, the sixth one is to implement sustainable programs such as e-learning policy, digitalization of materials, teachers and students, capability training, academic supports, and online learning platform. And um, the last one under curriculum instruction, assess the student's academic performance based on the LCU adopted grading system and uh, openly we're discouraging mass promotion. Uh, we have reservation, majority of us have reservation to do mass promotion uh, as mentioned by our chairman of CHED uh, because it has several implications. Uh, in our case, particularly those who um, years from now or one semester from now will take the board examination. Mass promotion, even if it can be substituted by academic requirements, may sacrifice, compromise the content of uh, the program that should be delivered to be able for them to become eligible in taking the board exams um, before the Professional Regulation Commission. The third one, uh, students' development. Um, accident, uh, incidentally, we've asked our LCUs also to, in the delivery of instructions, to monitor the condition of students during COVID-19 uh, pandemic and quarantine. And uh, by identifying their needs, uh, we have requested them to coordinate the social and economic needs of the students to the different uh, concerned government uh, agencies. So while we're delivering um, educational services to the students uh, during this quarantine, we've requested local colleges to also uh, on the side identify the needs of um, uh, the different uh, students enrolled in the local colleges and universities and provide data to the local government and other uh, government agencies like the Department of Social Welfare and Development and the like. Uh, the second one uh, mentioned by our PASO president uh, to provide assistance to the stranded students. Uh, the numbers of PASO is about 9,000 plus as mentioned earlier. Um, fortunately, our numbers is at about 9,000 because as local colleges, most of our students are uh, located in the same locality where uh, local colleges and universities are operating. Not like in the case of SUC, it's provincial in scope and people are located no, in different places. So uh, I'm, uh, I've seen the PASOC report, it's about 9,000. Ours is not that much, not even 1,000 um, based on our assumption. And of course, um, in support also of uh, CHED uh, original instruction uh, to postpone or cancel graduation ceremonies and other mass gatherings, uh, next would be to facilitate release of graduation credentials. And the last one, upon a presumption of process, conduct of the briefing session uh, to be able to take care of our students' mental health and so with the faculty members. And uh, even at this point, if it's possible to have face-to-face -face guidance program, uh, we invite local colleges to engage themselves also in addressing the students' needs uh, right now. The last one, the last area, um, our response framework will be research and extension. Um, we found this COVID-19 also, not just as a challenge, but as an opportunity for us as higher education institution. We've requested our local colleges to organize institutional extension services to vulnerable communities within school catchment area and to LUC, uh, LUC converted quarantine. We're happy to uh, hear reports that there are some local colleges and universities, faculty members and employees who work in partnership with the respective local governments. So they um, been helping local government units uh, in the packing of reliefs, uh, in some communication uh, uh, related functions in the, in the local government. Like in the case of Pamantasan and Lunsod ng Muntinlupa, under the leadership of Dr. Elena Presnedi, they've been in close coordination with the city government. Governor Alfonso Ditan College in Mindanao uh, has been tasked by, not tasked, but they volunteered to also help the provincial government and the city of Tangub. And at some point, they're the one managing the communication affairs of the city. So we found this COVID-19 as an opportunity also to bring education in the community translated into community services. 
Of course, the second one on the research and extension is to intensify volunteerism engagements among faculty and employees. And most importantly, uh, now under COVID-19, this will give uh, all faculty members and other and higher education institutions to make use uh, of the research centers as the research uh, provider uh, for all those who need it. Um, prioritize research initiative, initiatives on information and technology, teaching and learning process, online instructions, even food security, and other COVID-19 related research agenda. So what are the other, uh, in closing, what are the other ALCO, ALCOCOA initiated undertakings? Um, number one, um, we've been conducting for free web seminar and other virtual learning interventions uh, to our local colleges and universities. Uh, we will be providing trainings exclusive for deans, for faculty members, uh, field is specific or uh, discipline is specific also. And second, uh, we will be conducting our Alcohoa uh, virtual research congress uh, that we used to have face to face. Uh, we need to process the data that we're getting right now to be able to help um, uh, some agencies or uh, some frontline providers uh, to be more scientific in formulating decisions to help address issues related to um, COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, uh, for sustainability and uh, to motivate participating local colleges and universities, those who've implemented flexible learning for the one to shed um, instruction and those who will be implementing seamless, blended, and digital in whatever form, uh, we will be giving incentives to local colleges. We've launched the search for the best LCU seamless blended learning implementer. Uh, we've allocated um, 200,000 uh, to give to those who will win in the best LCU seamless blended learning implementer. While we find this as a threat, we've tried to convert this as an opportunity for local colleges to prove today that uh, despite COVID pandemic, we can still bridge the students to uh, the delivery of, to learn uh, under this crisis. And uh, from this date onwards, we're thinking that uh, blended learning and flexible will form part as normal in the will form part of the normal delivery of instruction, uh, particularly in local colleges and universities. Uh, we're even thinking that the online delivery will help address um, uh, problems on limited classrooms and facilities. And then of course, uh, finally, we used to have week, we, we were holding weekly um, LCU President's Virtual Forum. We started last March 13, and we're on our fourth run. Uh, initially, um, COVID-19 for LCU uh, is both an opportunity and a challenge. And um, LCU, through our president, uh, the president of ALGU, Dr. Rene Colocar, the president of the City College of Calapan, who is the ALCO president, um, we all believe that LCU should emerge still as a provider of relevant, responsive, and inclusive higher education after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just to share with you, um, the first President's Forum uh, focused more on the impact and implications of COVID-19 pandemic to LCU operations and instructional delivery. So prior to the extension last April 16, we met last April 16 in preparation, in anticipation of the announcement last April 16. Then after that, we conducted um, last April 20, the second President's Forum, but this is more of digital transformation of education. Uh, this has been attended by uh, uh, almost 80 local colleges and universities in the Philippines uh, to be able for us to redirect the management of our local colleges, allowing everyone to embrace that there is no other option but to embrace digital transformation education. And then last week, we got the chance to have um, the Central Director of Civil Service Commission uh, on our third President's Forum last April 27 for us to learn more about managing people in local colleges and universities during COVID-19 crisis. And this coming Monday, the fourth and the last maybe of our presence forum, 
we will be having a session to talk about legislative agenda in education after COVID-19. So where do we go from here? Just like PASOK uh, and also private universities and colleges. And of course, in accordance with our mother organization, CHED, there is no other option for LCUs but also to embrace the new normal in education. Embracing the new normal to gear LCUs and other public HEIs to the new normal, we have to revisit some policies under civil service. There might be some civil service rules that are not responsive or aligned to the new normal. Uh, as mentioned um, earlier, there will be about work from home, or we're even thinking that even if class will start in August, we may not be asking all our teachers to come Monday to Friday. As mentioned by Ched, those who can afford to deliver uh, instructions via online or online classroom or online learning, they can start in August, but we're even thinking that teachers and students may not all come at the same time from Monday to Friday, Might may come from twice a week and the rest of the days will be done online. The problem would be um, how their attendance will be treated. Because right now I've heard some local colleges and universities uh, trying to share with us that some part-timers, in some, some LGUs they're paying their part-timers, but in some local colleges, um, they were prohibited to pay uh, for their part-timers. Uh, why? Because there are some um, finance officers who believe that since there is suspension of classes and since uh, there is no delivery of instruction, there will be no basis to pay uh, their services. Because under Department of Budget pertinent circulars, uh, part-timers are being paid based on actual services rendered. So if they have not delivered anything, there will be no basis. But you know, this is a general statement. I've seen some local colleges and universities um, who have paid already, like Universidad de Manila, uh, Pamantasan ng Lunsod ng Manila, um, and majority of local colleges, they paid their part-timers primarily because they embrace um, digital learning or flexible learning, and they still have basis to present to regulatory body that they have basis to pay their part timer. So I guess um, through legislation, we have to revisit policies under civil service, policies um, related to Department of Budget and Management, Commission and Audit. And we're so happy that uh, had been so active uh, in issuing uh, memorandum circular covering HEIs. Of course, we're happy to hear uh, the practices of TESDA with Secretary La Pena and of course DepEd. And uh, of course, the would like to um, appeal to Congress that uh, the, all the mitigriti, you know, once we go back to normal, be translated into legislation to be able to avoid um, different or several interpretations once circulars uh, are cascaded in the local governments. The legislation relating to civil service, to budget, to auditing, and other relevant um, re legislation related to COVID no, would make LCUs and other HEIs uh, convenient uh, in embracing the what we call new normal. So from there, um, as the message is like for everyone, we have to embrace revolution. Uh, while we're sad it happened, um, we have no option but to to uh, embrace uh, the, the, the concept of revolution. revolution. I guess uh, just like when even good schools, the, the time to change is now. Change must not be merely reformative. It needs to be truly transformative and that is revolutionary. We believe that change has to be achieved first in the field of ideas, in our mindsets. And thank you for inviting us in this forum. Thank you to Chad for always involving us in their virtual meeting. Uh, for us, revolutionizing education is the next step to new normal. We must reconceive education, we must redefine learning, and so we have to reinvent schooling. And uh, the honorable members of the Committee on Higher and Technical Education, with you, we're willing to stage this revolution. A pleasant afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you for being part of this committee. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Arcega. Uh, before we ask our members to ask questions, 
Uh, let's listen to uh, Dr. or Attorney Erap Estrada for his presentation. And before that, I would like to recognize uh, one of our Congresswomen uh, present uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Franz Castro of the uh, ACT Teachers Party List. Good, good afternoon, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, if I may proceed, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, good afternoon to uh, the, uh, the honorable members of the Committee on Higher and Technical Education and to all our uh, government officials here present and my colleagues in uh, the public and private higher education sector. Uh, we'd like to present uh, uh, just uh, uh, two areas uh, specifically where we need the urgent uh, government or urgent uh, intervention from uh, our Congress. First, it's on the ability of our private higher education institutions to uh, continue delivering our education services. And number two, to manage the impact, the adverse economic impact of the uh, cessation of our operations, particularly on our school personnel. So we'd like to summarize our uh, request, uh, specific requests to, uh, to the committee to, and the, uh, to the legislature uh, on, on, five, uh, on these five points. First is on the uh, school opening. And uh, I think uh, our request uh, is already consistent with the pronouncements made by Chairperson uh, De Vera that uh, as soon as the higher education institutions are ready to to roll out flexible learning options that we be allowed to to resume our operations and need not wait until the uh, september uh where when it is september when when the students are allowed to, to report back to the schools to do face-to-face -face learning number two is uh would like to request for a government sponsored massive training of all faculty if uh, we may be included in whatever uh, training that may be rolled out for our faculty in the state universities and colleges and our local colleges and universities in the area of flexible learning options and uh, content development, because not all of our private higher education institutions have the resources to roll out a uh, massive uh, training for all their uh, faculty and teachers on this. And uh, number three, we would like to ask help of the uh, legislature and particularly this uh, committee to uh, help us uh, uh, get some uh, special reduced rates or even complementary access from our telecoms companies for internet services for our faculty and our students, at least for the next six months or for the next academic year in order for us to fully implement um, online education uh, uh, programs, if we're moving towards that, and also um, to, to support uh, blended uh, delivery of education. And uh, we'd also like to, to request and ask intervention of Congress for the provision of loans for, and subsidies for our students and faculty in the acquisition of computers, gadgets needed for online and blended education consistent with the provision of an existing law, the Open Distance Learning Act. And uh, lastly, we would like to ask on behalf of our school personnel, both faculty and non-teaching personnel affected by the ECQ uh, for a, uh, to be included in a social amelioration package. Uh, we would like to report to the committee that uh, most of our schools and uh, our school personnel, if not all, have been denied uh, the assistance, the financial assistance under the CAMP or the COVID-19 assistance measures program previously under the Dole. And uh, when it was transferred to the Department of Finance when the ECQ was extended, the uh, education sector, the education industry and its school personnel were not included in the industries and personnel qualified or eligible to uh, avail of the small business wage subsidy under the DOF. So as of now, 
our school personnel and our schools are not receiving any uh, financial assistance from uh, from any of uh, those uh, released under the Bayanihan as one uh, healing as one act. So um, in support of our requests, we just would like to show you uh, very briefly some important figures. On this first slide, we just would like to, to show the, uh, the figures uh, showing that the, uh, the, the enrollment in the higher education sector and in the basic education, the, the, the two uh, figures are very different. In, in basic education, private, uh, the enro enrollment in the private basic education schools are much lower than the enrollment in the, uh, in the higher education sector. We only account to 16% in basic education, but for higher education, it is 54% of the entire enrollment in the higher education institutions. Okay, sorry. Okay, now uh, with regard to the, uh, the implementation of flexible learning options, we'd like to report to the, uh, the, the uh, committee that the majority of our higher education institutions are ready to roll online open distance learning because uh, they are, uh, most of our institutions are already implementing these various modes even prior to the uh, national pandemic. And we'd like to show you here based on the survey that the Cocopeyas uh, commissioned prior to the extension of the ECQ, here it shows that 56% uh, of the uh, schools under Cocopeya are ready to start uh, the flexible learning options. And um, these institutions account to 75% of, uh, of around 245,000 students that are included in the survey. So this more or less mirrors the, uh, the uh, percentage in the entire private education sector. And uh, here in the next slide, we'd like to show you that in, the, uh, in those, who, those institutions who are ready to implement flexible learning options, 56% said that they are ready to do blended and around 44% 44 are saying uh, they can do fully online. This is for private higher education institutions. So you can see also there, those uh, in, ter in terms of uh, timelines and schedules, 68% said that they are ready now, and 4% uh, uh, said that they are uh, ready by summer, 16% in two months, and 8% within the next school year. Now, we also uh, uh, commissioned uh, a survey just two days ago to update uh, to update the, uh, uh, the sentiments and the actual situations from our member institutions. And uh, the results uh, are uh, more or less the same in terms of percentage. So in terms of readiness of schools to conduct flexible learning options, you see here, 60% said yes. But uh, here in, this, uh, in the survey, uh, we, we have aggregated the small, medium, and the big schools. And we also included those with basic education programs. Okay. So again, 60% said that they are ready to roll out flexible learning options. And then around 40% said uh, no as of this time. And in the modes of delivery, here it is shown that uh, around 47% said that they are... Uh, uh, they can implement through blending lear learning modes, okay? And uh, around uh, only around 3% can do fully online. Okay, here's another way of, of uh, showing it in terms of, uh, of modes of delivery, in terms of uh, the, the size of the schools. Okay, now we also asked our schools in terms of uh, student difficulty, should uh, we transition to flexible learning options? And here, as shown in this graph, around 50% of the students said that they would find it difficult to migrate or to transition to the various uh, flexible learning options or modes. 
and uh, this also shows the, the the aggregate percentage of the small, medium, and the large schools. Okay, in terms of uh, sorry, in terms of uh, the impact on our school personnel, the uh, here we would like to show the estimate uh, losses in terms of the salaries absorbed by the private higher education institutions, even with the uh, um, suspended operation. So we just based it on, uh, on the labor market profile provided by the Department of Labor and Employment in terms of number of employees. But I think uh, we have increased substantially, but just basing it conservatively to the 1.2 million employees in 2017, and by multiplying it to the salary average salary of uh, of educators at 18000 you can all already see there's around the 21 billion for the entire sector of uh, losses in terms of salaries absorbed or salaries paid to its uh, school personnel while on uh, on uh, suspended operations and uh, prior to the extension of the of the ECQ we also had a survey of our members and we asked them until what until uh, what date or until what period they can uh, continue to pay the salaries of their employees without operating and uh, 51% said initially that uh, they can only continue paying the salaries of their uh, school personnel up to April 30 okay and uh, Around 22% said until May 15, 12% and until or 12% uh, in June until June 30, and 3% until July 30. Currently, we have 77,000 uh, faculty in the private higher education institutions, excluding the non-teaching uh, uh, and administrative personnel. So this is just the, showing the breakdown of the uh, uh, faculty profile, those with the master's degrees and those with doctorate degrees. But in total, we have uh, 77,000 faculty for higher education institutions. And uh, we also included here, uh, in case uh, of uh, for, for future reference, if there will be a consolidated report on the, uh, also with the basic education committees, we also included here, the uh, number of private basic education employees who are affected. This is relevant for us because a lot of our private higher education institutions also offer basic education programs and employ teachers and school personnel for the ba basic education courses. Excuse me. So for uh, the estimates in terms of revenue loss, here we uh, provided uh, different scenarios. So. We projected the loss if school opening for school year 2020-2021 is pushed to August, the total revenue loss is around 55 billion. And if school opening for school year, the next school year is pushed to September, it will uh, balloon to 79 billion. It, uh, it shows that there is a 31% increase in terms of revenue loss on uh, per month of delay. Okay. Now, if the entire semester in school year 2020-21 is lost, then the total revenue loss for the entire sector would balloon to 142 billion. We also made some calculations that uh, if, if the academic year would be further delayed uh, beyond September, then uh, effectively there's a one semester or one academic year already lost because we would have uh, because a lot of us would have started in june uh, 74 percent of our private higher education institutions based last year are still uh, have have opened in june last year so they have not uh, transitioned or changed their their academic calendar to august so they are the ones who are uh, seriously adversely affected if the uh, if the opening is further delayed okay <clears throat> and uh, there of course there will be uh, uh, effects adverse uh, effects related to the to the delay of of the uh, school opening 
um, we'll have delay in the uh, production of our uh, graduates and uh, to be members of the workforce and also those who will uh, take the professional boards and uh, we'll have a delay. I think we'll have a, a postponement of the licensure examinations. So this will affect our workforce next year in terms of uh, uh, new graduates and new professionals. <clears throat> now, we, we also had uh, another survey uh, just two, two days ago uh, to, uh, to update uh, 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 the, the schools on the latest developments and latest pronouncements by the IATF. And uh, these are the school's demographics who, who answered the, the, or accomplished the survey. Okay, so the total respondents is 467. Uh, distributed uh, uh, on depending on the size of the schools from small and medium and large schools. And uh, here we, we uh, found uh, the following results. <clears throat> In terms of those who are whose staff are under no work, no pay arrangement, here you can see that 51% uh, of the small schools are, are under no work, no pay currently. And the other, other uh, schools are not far on this. The uh, medium schools are 42% uh, 40, of their em employees and school personnel are under no work, no pay. And the large schools are uh, at 38% of their, of their school personnel under no work, no pay arrangement. And uh, we also asked the, um, the schools in terms of their staff in need of financial assistance. And here you can see the small schools, 88%, almost 89% of their staff are in need or in urgent need of financial assistance. And uh, you can also see there the, the uh, medium schools and the large schools are not also far behind. 82% in uh, medium schools and 81% in the larger schools. We also asked our, our member education institutions until when will they consider closing down uh, from the time of the survey two days ago. So 61% said they would consider, assuming there's no government assistance and intervention, they are considering uh, closing down the school within a period of one to three months. And uh, you can see there 14% said in four to six months and 2% um, said in seven to nine months and 19% in one school year. We only have 10 months in a school year. So majority are considering uh, closing down if uh, they don't, assuming they don't get any loans or any financial assistance from, from the government. And... Um, Okay, this is just a different uh, uh, manner of, of showing different graph, but uh, uh, the same on the same item. All right. Now we also asked until when the schools will be able to pay their employees before they uh, run out of uh, resources. So again, it, it uh, mirrors the, the same result that in the survey that we conducted prior to the prior to the uh, extension of the ECQ. So around uh, 60% or more than 50% said that uh, by May 31, yeah, May 31, because here 20% are saying by May and uh, the others are before May, April 30, all right? So majority are still there uh, only up to May. A uh, very small percentage of the schools are saying they can still survive until August of 2020. Okay, so there, there's a different uh, graph showing this, but the same result in the survey. Until when will you be able to pay your employees before you run out of resources? And there it shows that uh, the majority said that uh, they can only sustain up to May 31. 
And uh, in terms of uh, those with, uh, with uh, uncollected fees from students, we also ask the, the member education institutions. And here it shows that um, uh, those, uh, the aggregate uh, schools in, in the, across the, uh, with the different sizes of the schools, around 48% of the students are with outstanding balance. All right, so almost 49% of the students have unpaid tuition or balance with our member private or member education institutions. Okay, and uh, we also asked the in terms of uh, student population that would need government support, around 50% of the students in our member said they need government support. Okay. That ends the, our uh, presentation. And uh, again, would like to, to appeal to uh, the, the, the legislature for our urgent request, particularly for us to, uh, to get back into our operations so that we can also sustain our, especially our school personnel and other fixed costs. And uh, so that the quality of education also may not be affected as we continue to explore the various uh, flexible learning, teaching and learning modes. Maraming salamat po and again, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Attorney Erap Estrada. If I look at your uh, executive summary, you have identified basically five recommendations. I think the first one of uh, allowing private schools to open classes in August uh, or earlier using flexi learning opportunities and other blended learning opportunities, I think uh, will not be a big problem to address. Uh, as long as also, of course, uh, they comply with the new normal that will be implemented in the various state university, I mean, in the various higher educational institutions. Now, on the second one, uh, do you have any idea of how many uh, sponsored training programs that you'd like to have for faculty and probably translate this into cost, how much will this cost if uh, we will implement this now? Uh, then the third one is uh, uh, reducing rates and complementary access from telecom companies. I think we can make representation on this with the telecom companies. Uh, probably give a discount uh, and probably the government can subsidize uh, you know, this uh, recommendation. And fourth one is provision of loans and subsidies for students and faculty in the acquisition of computers. Uh, looking at your uh, presentation earlier, you have not mentioned the specific number of computers uh, and how much probably the cost will this cost the government just in case uh, we can uh, find uh, you know, funding for this. And uh, number five, financial assistance to faculty and student school personnel affected by ECQ, particularly the minimum wage earners. Uh, we will uh, we have tests right now. Uh, then we have also the student financial program under the UNIFAS, but uh, probably we need to add more on this. Uh, so we need to find out, uh, and probably we can review this when we go back to Congress of how much will be the cost of all of these recommendations. So again. Uh, would you like to react? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Chair, you, with the request for financial assistance, that is for our faculty and school personnel, and not for the students, because right now they're they have not they've been rendered ineligible to uh, apply for the either for the camp or for the small business wages uh, subsidy under the OF. So they're not receiving any financial subsidy. Um, we will we will submit uh, the uh, required data. Uh, that you have mentioned, but in, but we have uh, more or less some idea on the costs, uh, particularly on the connectivity requirement, for example, of the students. Uh, there are uh, rates being uh, proposed by the telecoms company. So more or less, if we, we will uh, uh, subsidize that, we have more or less an idea around 1,200 for the Wi-Fi. Uh, but of course, if they can provide complementary access or at least for some few months or for the semester, it will really help a lot 
for us in establishing our cyber infrastructure to implement the, the flexible learning options for us. But uh, we will submit, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, those, uh, we'll try to get uh, the uh, data uh, as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, I think, uh, yes, uh, I think your, the number five uh, recommendation is particularly <laughs> for faculty and faculty. Your, yes, yes, uh, yes. school personnel. Uh, and uh, that will be an added uh, you know, budget that should be included here. Uh, in the proposal of the stimulus package bill of uh, Congressman Salceda and Congresswoman Kimbo, they did not specifically mention uh, the package for uh, you know, uh, the education sector. And uh, probably this committee can, you know, can move on this and uh, uh, probably come out with a separate package that will address the concerns that you have mentioned uh, in this particular uh, proposal. So before we, you know, we would like to ask uh, Congresswoman uh, Swan Singh uh, to ask uh, uh, another question uh, to our, uh, our resource persons. Please, uh, Congresswoman uh, Swan Singh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, few, few um, com comments no, uh, to Dr. Arab Estrada. Um, I was uh, uh, on the line with uh, Chairman uh, uh, Sharon uh, Garin about the, the bills, you know, the stimulus uh, package bills. And she was saying, because I was asking her, how come that um, uh, there is no provision on the assistance to students and uh, teachers? And she was saying that uh, the stimulus package is to protect jobs and therefore, uh, they don't uh, foresee that uh, there will be um, problems with the financial uh, capabilities of students because we are protecting jobs. And therefore, um, we don't see that uh, there is.